Hi folks and welcome back to the Scotch Tracker. Today joining us is an award nominated author of several Star Trek novels. He has also written articles for the official Star Trek magazine and co-wrote with Eric A. Stilwell the story for the first season Voyager episode Prime Factors. Uh, please welcome David R. George III. Woo! Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on the show. Um, welcome also to, to uh, Danny and uh, Bob for uh, joining the discussion. Uh, David, looking back, what are your earliest memories of Star Trek? My earliest memories of Star Trek, I was, I was very young. I was probably like four years old. Um, my dad was a science fiction fan, and Star Trek, you know, Star Trek. In syndication was on everywhere all the time, and I believe the, the my earliest memory is watching the Corbomite maneuver, um, mm, cool. which, um, it, in my mind, it, it's interesting. I, I remember loving it as a four year old, um, but then as I got older, sort of um, getting away from that evaluation of the episode, not just thinking of it as as uh, I don't know, not, not a particularly good episode. In some ways, it doesn't look like the rest of Star Trek because it uh, was such an early episode. It was the first episode ever produced a after the pilots, even though it didn't get aired until number 10. But I have a, a, I've come to a really strong appreciation of that episode because it sets a lot of what Star Trek is in motion. It's, it's you know, by the time you get to Next Generation, there's less of a sense, even though Next Generation is great, there's less of a sense of the unknown very often. Um, but in that original Star Trek, there's much more of that. And in that first episode in particular, we get a lot of the, the uh, um, tropes that, that uh, infuse science fiction sort of at its best when you're dealing with the unknown and how you deal with it. Um, it's, it's a really fine episode. But that's my earliest memory of the show. Cool. Um, so how did you start writing uh, Star Trek or about Star Trek? Well, uh, I, my dad um, actually was a, a writer and an editor uh, and an art director um, for magazines. And um, his father, my grandfather, was also a writer and editor. Uh, and um, my great uncle actually was also a writer, um, uh, although he also had a, a sort of a more interesting life, too, because he was in the OSS, which is, it was the forerunner of the CIA, uh, and he was the number three guy at the CIA. He actually helped found the CIA. Um, at any rate, uh, he's got three books. Well, I have three books of his. I think he might have a fourth, um, but um, he's gone now. But but they're, they're nonfiction books about flying. Um, and my mother instilled in my sister and me a tremendous love of reading. Um, and I think combined with all of that, this sort of uh, being surrounded by writing and, and just having a, tr a tremendous love of reading uh, is what motivated me to want to tell stories. And uh, I got my first typewriter when I was five or six years old and I would pound on the keys and, and, mm -hmm. um, I think they wrote my first Star Trek. It was probably ten or eleven, maybe twelve, something like that. Oh, wow! It wasn't any. I, I had no. I actually had no interest in fan fiction. Um, I don't. Hmm. I don't think I've ever read fan fiction. Um, maybe once or twice, but I, I just. I, I don't know. I just. So I didn't no, have an interest. Hmm? I was going to say. So no Fifty Shades of Grey for you. <laughs> no, 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 Spock or, you know, no. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know why, but I just, it just never uh, appealed to me either to read or to write. I mean, I guess you could say that I was writing fan fiction um, 
but my intention was always to get published. Now, as an 11 or 12 year old, um, that was unlikely. And I never sort of tried at that age to, to, to get anything published. Um, but I do, I remember reading, um, at some point reading the novelization of Star Trek, the motion picture. And oh, cool. there was a lot in the, in that novel, there was, uh, something that never made it to the screen. Uh, and I don't know if it was ever in the script at any point. Um, but it was a relationship that Kirk had between the end of the original series and Star Trek, the motion picture with, um, an, with an admiral who, uh, she sort of was, her name, Lori Chiani or Chiana, one or the other. And she was um, used by Admiral Nagura to sort of mo to, to, to manipulate Kirk. Um, it, it was at the very beginning of the novel, something that, as I said, didn't make it into Star Trek, the motion picture. But I sort of, I, I remember in my, my, my fiction um, at that age, glomming onto that and, and sort of, Talk if, using that um, that relationship we never saw to to understand some of the things that happened and also to to fully uh, um, explore that relationship, um, which I actually got to do a little bit later in a book that I actually had published. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I just I like I like telling stories. Uh, partly, I think. A, even though I had, a, I was surrounded by writers, and that helped. I think really, reading is what made me like telling stories because I like reading stories, um, and a lot of that is just character. So I, I, I took those pieces out of the novelization of Star Trek: The Motion Picture and started started mucking about. The, I guess that really does sound like fan fiction, but I never tried to get it published in a fanzine or anything like that. As I said, my my thought was always, oh, I'll get this published, you know. Even though, as you know, a ten-year-old, I had no idea how to do that. So, speaking on that, have you ever revisited some of those stories that you wrote as as a kid, or were you able to use those in writings that you've done uh, professionally? Uh, well, I would say that, uh, and I hope this is true, that what I wrote as ten was not as good as what I wrote when I was thirty. Um, <laughs> so. I, I haven't really incorporated it, but I have incorporated some of the actual ideas that I had, um, like, you know, using that character uh, from Star Trek motion picture novelization um, and some of the ideas surrounding that. That first, the first novel, because I, I envisioned it as a novel, I never finished it, um, when I was a kid, I called Earthbound. Um, and it was referring to that time period between the end of the original series and Star Trek The Motion Picture when Kirk was just on Earth, which is what mm -hmm. Star Trek The Motion Picture tells us, that he was sort of maneuver maneuvered into his admiralty and, and command had been sort of taken away from him, even though he had a, a, a high-ranking place in Starfleet Command. Um, he was, was Earthbound. So, um, yeah, I liked exploring that. But I, I've used some of the ideas, but certainly not the actual writing. David, when we interview authors, and, and we've interviewed several, um, we always get a chance to talk to them a little bit about how they do their own writing process. Like, we've had one author who puts stuff up on a board and pins and, and keeps track of, of characters. What is your secret? What is How is your process? Well, it's no secret, but... <laughs> well, ideas, yeah. not maybe a secret, but ideas and <laughs> keeping track of continuity and, and uh, you know, and characters sure. and things like that, you know. Continuity, oh boy. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think if you, talk, if you talk to 10 different writers, you'll get 12 different processes. Uh, well, I mean, right, yeah. Everybody has to find out what works for them. And what's interesting um, for me is that... Uh, the process has sort of changed. I was actually thinking about this uh, this morning. Um, it means my process has sort of changed over the years, but um, I am, I don't just to talk about having, you know, writing, writing up on a whiteboard or, or, or having mm -hmm. index cards. I've done that. I don't usually do that, but I, um, I wrote a novel called Provenance of Shadows, which is an original series novel about uh, Dr. McCoy. And, it turned out to be uh, lengthy, 
Uh, it's 225,000 words. I think it's the longest Star Trek never, novel ever published, which, you know, being long doesn't make it good. It just, uh, if it's bad, it makes it interminable. Um, <laughs> no, no good book can be too long. No bad book can be too short. Um, <laughs> but that novel was so complicated, uh, which is part of, which is the main reason it, it had such length. Um, that novel was so complicated that I did actually have to write things down on index cards and, and sort of mix and max. In that case, I like to write complicated stories, which is one of the reasons my stories tend to be longer, just because it takes a while. Mm -hmm. If you're going to tell a complicated story, it, it takes some time to to, sure. just, uh, to, to to weave that together. And in the case of Provenance of Shadows, it was so complicated that I, I couldn't, I had an idea of what I wanted for, uh, to be the structure of the book, but it was, it was difficult to find it was it was you know it involves mccoy back in time when he went to to uh to earth in 1930 uh, uh through the guardian of forever you know it's a, mm -hmm. a, the, the that novel is the first of a trilogy that that centers around the city on the edge forever a beloved episode from the original and um i, I just um i had so many story threads because it weaved between McCoy in the, in the 30s on Earth and and Kirk and Spock and McCoy and the crew in the in the 23rd century, and and their both stories progressed over time and it was complicated for me and so I, I had to resort to index cards and and my entire my office floor was entirely covered uh, because of a lot of index cards, but generally I don't do that. Gen Generally, one of the things I discovered in writing Star in, in writing Star Trek is that what is required to write a Star Trek novel actually is something I require as a writer myself. I didn't know that before I started it, but um, because Star Trek uh, Simon and Schuster has the rights to publish Star Trek novels right now, mm -hmm. and um, so you have to write uh, an outline, a narrative outline for them to be able to approve or disapprove the outline. They have to know. Uh, the broad strokes of the story, the beginning, the middle, the end. They have to know the character arcs, where you're taking uh, everybody. Um, but they're not the only people who have to know. The copyright owner has to know. CBS Studios has to know. And so um, it's, a, it's a dual approval process, really. It goes to Simon & Schuster and the editor there, but then it also has to go to CBS Studios and they have to approve it. So that narrative outline has to be... Um, it has to be strong enough uh, for them to like and approve, and it has to be um, detailed enough for them to know, to have a really good idea of what you're doing, because they're protecting their right. their yeah. their property. They ha they you know they they don't want extreme violence in Star Trek because that's not what Star Trek is. They don't want want uh, pornographic sex in Star Trek. They don't want, you know, there are all these things that don't belong in Star Trek. Star Trek is, a, you know, a, a pretty clear thing, although it, it's because it's science fiction uh, and intelligent. It is a, it's broad enough that it can accommodate a lot of different types of stories. So you, I just have to start with an outline. And from from before I get there, I have to figure out, OK, what is it? But the first thing I always ask myself is, what is it I want to write about? And I don't really sort of mean that in terms of which series or what the story is going to look like, but I mean it thematically. What do I feel like talking about? Do I feel like uh, telling a story that is about, uh, you know, climate change in some way um, or, or uh, racism or, or, you know, something simpler like, like love? Um, mm -hmm. and I just, I just, so I start sort of thematically and usually I n know which series I'm going to be writing in. Um, when I, the first <clears throat> Star Trek novel I sold was a deep space nine novel, which I sold with Armin Shimmerman mm -hmm. and I were working together. Best um, and I've written ever. a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I love deep space nine. Deep space nine is very complex. Um, it's uh, it's got those shades of gray that some of the other Star Treks don't quite have, and uh, I have a I have a lot of reasons that I love Deep Space Nine. I think it was one of the best pilots because yeah. it, was, it it provided such a textured landscape 
such a, a, a great detailed backdrop on which to tell stories because you had, first of all, you had Starfleet characters uh, in an environment that wasn't Starfleet. You had Starfleet characters interacting with civilians and with, with uh, um, the Bajoran uh, non-Starfleet, but, but still, um, I guess, military characters. Um, and, yeah, I mean, there were just so many uh, stories. It, it's Cisco's backstory with the loss of his wife, or a single father. It's just great. There were just so much. It's such a, a great palette on which to, to paint yeah. the story. Um, Agreed. Oh, absolutely. But so I... Um, so I, I, I went, Armin and I pitched Deep Space Nine, but after that, I've written 18 Star Trek novels, and, and each and every time after that, I've been approached by Simon Schuster, hey, do you want to write this? Uh, and so usually I know what I'm going to, which series I'm going to be writing in. So once I figure out what I want to talk about, what my, my thematic elements are, I, I start um trying to cast about for a story whether what's the story that I want to tell and um, sometimes I have some elements I when I wrote a novel called uh, another deep space nine novel called rough beasts of empire I was uh, I was asked to write a deep space nine novel that included Spock so it's, and I was asked to get Cisco back in Starfleet um, spoiler alert Cisco's gone at the end of deep space nine but at some point, he says he's coming back, and at some point in the books, he does. Because, as I'm sure you all know, um, when the Next Generation ended, and then when Deep Space Nine ended, and Voyager ended, uh, and Enterprise, when all these series ended, um, the, the editors carried the stories forward in the books. Uh, and in the case of Deep Space Nine, we started with a uh, two-book series called Avatar by, uh, by Stephanie Perry um, that takes uh, that picks up the story three months after... Uh, the last episode, what you leave behind, and and we just carried the story forward from there, and carried it for years, years in terms of our own writing, and years in terms of uh, uh, the within the story itself, the, the characters lived for several years. So at some point, Cisco does come back from uh, the Celestial Temple, and my my um, imperative for Rough Beast of Empire for my editor was we want to include Spock and we want to get Cisco back in Starfleet. So I had to figure out how to do that, all in the context of, of my the thematic elements I wanted to tell. Usually I don't have as strong a mandate in terms of, of story details and I can I can you know do just about anything I want. The editors, um, my editor my editors at uh, Simon and Schuster were Marco Palmieri um, for, for quite a few years, and then uh, for even more years, Margaret Clark. And they are both really good editors. They're both very creative. Um, they are, they know Star Trek inside and out, which is tremendously helpful uh, because, um, I, I, well, you can just imagine what it would be like to work with somebody who doesn't know Star Trek. Um, so they were great. And they also gave us, uh, us the, the Star Trek novelist, tremendous latitude uh, on what we could and couldn't do. Um, and I mean, I've, I, I don't try to do this, but occasionally a story requires it. And um, I, I, I've killed canon characters in my novels. Um, <laughs> sure so I mean, to. that's the, mm -hmm. yeah, you do what you have to do to serve the story. And mm -hmm. that just is an, gives you an idea of the latitude that we get um from these editors. They're just tremendously, tremendously um, uh, helpful um, in, in, in allowing you to tell the story you want to tell and also, uh, fortunately, helping make it better after that. They do a great job uh, as editors. Uh, so, yeah, that, I mean, that's my process, basically, is I, I just, I, you know, I start with the theme, I move, I move to, to plot and character, and then I write this narrative outline uh, which can be, I think the, my shortest outline was about 12 or 14 pages, something. I think the, the, the outline uh, for the 34th rule, my first one was 12 to 14 pages, something like that. And I think my longest one was 56 or something like that. And that was for Providence of Shadows because it was such a long and complicated novel. And that, what that does too, what I've discovered for myself, I mean, I have to do that as a part of the, the requirements of the job. Uh, so that Simon Schuster can approve it, so that CBS Studios can approve it, and 
back in the day, it was Paramount. At some point, it was Viacom. Now it's CBS Studios. Um, I've discovered that as a writer, I need that roadmap. Because if I start, even if I have a story in my head, if I start without having that outline, I'll go off the rails. I will go off on tangents. I will never finish. Uh, I, I need to know exactly where I'm going. Now, there's a lot of latitude in there for myself, um, from my outline. I can, you know, I can write that these two characters have to have an interaction and, and this has to be the outcome, but I don't know where it's going to take place or how mm. that conversation is going to evolve. So there's a lot of creativity involved. But in some sense, after writing the outline, which is the hardest writing that I do, that, that 12 or 14 pages of, of the, the 34th rule outline was far more difficult to write than the 135,000 word novel that followed. 135,000 novel, word no, novel took a lot longer, but I knew exactly where I was going. And I, yeah. you know, it was, in some sense, I can say it's just sort of filling in the blanks. It's more than that, obviously. There's a lot of creativity involved in, in trying to figure out how to fill in the blanks. But um, that that initial writing, you know, the tyranny of the blank page, as they say. I used mm -hmm. to I used to say that writing. Um, somebody said this, and I, I but I don't know who. Um, but I, I, I adopted it at some point that writing is easy. You just stare stare at a blank screen until your forehead starts to bleed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 become it's not quite so painful anymore. It, it used to be uh, when I was writing. It used to be just a, a really gut-wrenching process uh, just uh, and it, and now the more i do it um the more often i do it in terms of um writing in a daily basis and writing for hours it just it's gotten easier it's um um it's just i still sweat every word every sentence every paragraph but it's not um it's not it's it's more enjoyable than it used to be but because it's easier in some sense, because I've, I've gotten used to the process and I, 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 I you know, I, I know how to do it. Um, I, I often, when I, when I pick up a new project, I try and complicate it. Um, I try and make it more difficult because that's, I, I think that's the only way you get better at things. If you're doing the same thing and it's, and it's easy, that's great. Yeah. But it's going to stay at that level, I think. I mean, that. It's, yeah, you want to challenge sport. yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in terms of sports, if you're playing uh, somebody in tennis who's your equivalent, you're going to stay at that level. You're just going to stay at that level of play. Um, but if you play somebody who's better, you, you may lose a lot, but you're also going to gain. You know, I think over time improve. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, and I think that goes for a lot of things in life. So I always try and and. Um, I, I get, try and give myself harder and harder tasks when I write, um, which, you know, isn't always fun, but um, I, I don't know. It just makes it more, I guess, enjoyable. Uh, 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 you know, uh, I, I want to try and get better. So, um, and then, and, and then once I have the outline and once it gets approved, it's just, uh, or, or if I'm writing my own thing and I have an outline, cause I, I, that's what I discovered is I need an outline. So I, I, you know, even when I'm writing stuff that's not media tie-in, that it's just my own stuff, I have to, I have to write an outline so that I have this roadmap for myself. And once I get so, that, then um, I can just start writing. And I don't, I know some writers will hop around; they'll write the end first, or or the, you know, the, oh this middle section that they <laughs> want to love, that want to write that they love. I, I, I can't. I don't. I mean, I can do that. I don't like to do that because. I feel as a writer that I should have the same experience as the reader, right? Mm -hmm. um, and while I'm sure there are readers who read the last chapter first, I'm thinking the bulk of readers do not. <sighs> yeah, don't. <Yeah! laughs> That's a cheat. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, so I was you know, wondering I just... if the, the I'm sorry, I was wondering if like the licensee, like whether it be CBS or Paramount or Viacom, um, if they would ever like give you notes back. Uh, about the, the outline or if they would if it would just be like an approval process um notes can be certainly a part of the approval process i know writers who've gotten um extensive notes uh mm. i have have not um and in fact the first for a while when i was writing the star trek novels i, I actually didn't have any idea that they gave notes um <laughs> 
because they didn't give me any, or at least none that, that I knew about. I mean, my, I suppose my editor could have um, sort of gotten them and then passed them on to me. But um, at some point, the first time I, I got a note from CBS that I knew about um, was they, they, my editor sent me their approval and in their approval, their note was, this is terrific, <laughs> which hmm. that's a pretty good note. To that's get. always good. Um, yeah. <laughs> but they had kind of notes. But, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. But uh, later they asked, they, they would say um, some other things that, uh, uh, they, yeah, I did get notes from them, but nothing tremendously complicated, uh, nothing big, nothing really that, uh, changing the structure of something or changing a plot line. There, there just, there, there, there wasn't, I think, and part of that is not just, be, you know, me saying, Oh, I look how good a writer I am. It's also the editors, right? Because by the time uh, the outline is done, I've also worked with my editors on, on, on figuring out the story. I mean, I've, I've come up with a story and, and, a, uh, you know, the editor can say to me, you know, this, this part doesn't really work, you know? Uh, and again, Marco and then Margaret really knew Star Trek. And Margaret in particular has said to me on two or three occasions, that's not Star Trek. And, and each time I, I, I was like, no, that's, that's Star Trek. That's absolutely Star Trek. And then I thought about it. I'm like, nah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Um, I, I mean, I, I had a, um, uh, in original sin, I had a scene where, it, it was it, it served a purpose i had to have uh, uh, an act of violence a shocking act of violence in order to motivate this particular action and and something that happened with this particular character and the way i wrote it i mean it was it was horrible it was it was uh i mean i i, I basically tore somebody's arm off ouch uh, yeah <laughs> That and doesn't Margaret go back said, easily. Yeah, <laughs> Margaret said to me, you, you, "You just can't do that. That's that's you just can't do that." And I was like, "It's." I was really committed. I said, this, because of the nature of the story, this this act of violence, I needed something like this to to motivate the character to, and that's beyond motivation. In order to, this character had um, abilities, and in order to to reveal these abilities it had to be something extreme and I, I just i was really committed to it and i argued with margaret um you know in a good way uh in a creative way and then i thought about it and i thought about it I like, you know what she's right she's right there's got to be a, a different way to do this and in fact of course there are a million ways to do everything uh when it comes to that sort of thing and and so i i changed it and margaret was absolutely right uh and um you know, that's happened a few times, particularly with Margaret, with her just saying, yeah, you know, that's that doesn't really fit into the Star Trek universe. What you're trying to do fits in, but the way you did it here doesn't quite work. So so um, the outline by the time it gets to Paramount or Viacom or CBS now has already been worked over both by me and by the editor. So, uh, um, I mean, that that I think helps to to lessen the amount of notes that we get. Um, but yeah, they, they'll give notes. They, they're not shy. Um, <laughs> not Paula, Bl Paula Block was the person over there at Paramount for many years, um, who was great, also very creative. And, uh, it's John Van Sitters now, uh, at CBS and, and they also know Star Trek and they, they know what they're doing as well. So it, it's all very helpful. It's all, um, um, you know, I, I've got the bulk of the work, but it's also a team effort. Is uh, is there a character that you like to write for the most or a character that you have not gotten to write for? Well, you know... And it doesn't um, have to be Star Trek either, but... Oh, that's interesting. You know, I don't really... Uh, the only other media tie-in character that I've ever tried to write is James Bond. Ah, which is, that's which interesting. Is, 007. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> which is sort of weird to me because it's not it's not uh, bond is not the type of character that uh, the type of movie that i sort of gravitate toward normally but when i was uh, i think i was 10 or 11 our next door neighbor uh who was a, a teenager 
was getting rid of some of his things and he had a box of things and, and asked my sister and me if we wanted anything. And among other things were all of the James Bond novels and actually one anthology or, or a collection. Mm. Um, and so I, you know, being a reader, I just, oh, I'll take these. And I read the James Bond novels and the, and the collection, of, there's a collection of short stories by Ian Fleming. Um, I read all of those uh, and just sort of fell in love with the character, even though they're not the most literary novels. Um, uh, and, but as a 10 or 11 year old, I didn't really care about that. Um, <laughs> But I just, I just love, and then I started watching the movies, and I loved that, and and so um, probably when I was maybe fourteen or so, I started writing a James Bond novel, figuring, well, Ian Fleming's dead. Uh, <laughs> they're not going to give up on this this character that is beloved worldwide and that makes them a lot of money in movies. They're, they're at some point they're going to write new James Bond novels, and so I started writing one called Absolute Zero. Um, <laughs> And brought back Blofeld, uh, Ernst Stavro Blofeld, Inspector. Uh, I mean, I just, I never finished it, uh, but I started it. And I, I wonder if I still have that somewhere. Um, and, and, you know, again, knew, at 14, knew nothing about publishing, didn't want to do it as fan fiction, but, and I never, I never finished it. But I, I, I did have some good sense about this thing because they did obviously start writing new james bond novels other writers started picking up the the bond yeah. mantle james uh, Garner, yeah. Garner, yeah uh and john Gardner, and then now john started, Garner, yeah. yeah and they started uh right making um less um well more serious movies hmm. with the Dan with daniel craig and casino royale and, mm -hmm. and on from there mm -hmm. they started more, making sort of more serious movies which uh I should have I should have kept writing the James Bond is what I think. <laughs> but but, it, but I, other than that, I've never Bond. really written any any, uh, any other media tying characters besides Star Trek. I've never written Enterprise characters, uh, and I guess it will be fun to write Archer, um, to Paul. Like uh, but I I really like I like I like writing a lot of them. Kirk was always my guy, so I uh, but I, I haven't I haven't actually written that much Kirk, and I don't feel like I've necessarily done him justice but i really really love writing kira i love writing kira oh. i think kira is a really interesting character um i think nana just got better and better in her portrayal and she certainly has flourished in the novels and has had a a, a really um variegated life i mean starting as as a girl growing up under the occupation and then becoming a freedom fighter mm -hmm. and um, you know, her position on Deep Space Nine. At the end of Deep Space Nine, you know, she becomes the cap commander of the station, which we carried forward in the in the post television series novels. Um, and then she she even moves beyond that. Um, I like writing Ro Laren. Uh, another spoiler ah. alert, but you know, yeah. Elsa Ro from Next Generation shows up. Well, as as viewers of the podcast, as Star Trek fans may know, that that Ro. Laren was introduced in Next Generation in large mm -hmm. part to move to Deep Space Nine. She yeah. was supposed to be the first officer. Um, but Michelle Forbes, who play, portrayed the character on, on uh, Next Generation, uh, just de declined the role. And so they created Kira. Um, and, mm -hmm. oh. But in the novels, uh, we actually didn't need Michelle Forbes' approval. So we, we, <laughs> mm -hmm. Ro Laren became a uh, character. She she ends up uh, at some point on Deep Space Nine as uh, the security chief, um, and and she, as was true of the series, things changed from there. One of the one of the great things I love about Deep Space Nine is that unlike the other Star Trek series, um, for the most part, uh, we have uh, a lot of mutability. Right, things mm -hmm. things change. Um, I, I mean. Dr. Bashir is a, is this, you know, nerdy, uh, bookworm, uh, nope, turns out he's genetically engineered. Okay. So <laughs> massive Got changes in the show. Surprise. Uh, it, it didn't happen in other series. And so I, I think Marco, uh, initially, and then Margaret really did a great job of, of keeping that feel of Deep Space Nine being, um, ever changeable. Um, 
in the books. And uh, and so Rose starts out as security chief on Deep Space Nine at some point, and uh, and then her character evolves from there. I don't want to give too many spoilers. No, no. I don't know if people are still reading the Deep Space Nine novels. I love Deep Space Nine. <laughs> I, mean, I was um, sorry. I was surprised uh, by how much you've written about um, like Harriman and Demora Sulu and the Enterprise B. I wondered if you've got like an affinity for that. Actually, you know what? That's that's another another character that I love is Demora. I love Demora. Mm -hmm. I feel very proprietary toward Demora, which is. Uh, wrong because i didn't create the character um, obviously her first <laughs> appearance was in in star trek uh, generations but i, I you know I, I like alan ruck and i like the I idea like of ruck. harriman but i did not like how harriman came off in star trek generations he seemed i would agree <laughs> yeah it, to me, like to not me, a guy was, should be a captain Right, that's what you get the feel of. Is well, why? Why is this guy a captain of a starship? He doesn't. It, it, mm. He just. It doesn't. He do, it doesn't. It doesn't seem right. So, um, when I was asked to write a lost era novel by Marco Palmieri, well, actually, Marco said, "Hey, I want you to write a lost era novel," and we're thinking uh, Enterprise B and the Tomate incident, which is which was just a reference in. Um, what was the, the the reappearance of the Romulans in Next Generation, the end of the first season? What was that episode? Um, ah, I don't I slips my mind at the moment. But oh, uh, um, the, the neutral zone. The neutral zone. So mm. so yeah, it was just a passing reference. Um, but you know that's what Mar Marco wanted to do. So I, I, I would say I, the Tome Medicine could be anything you wanted to make it, and, and in fact was what I wanted to make it. Um, but I wanted my. One of my goals in writing uh, that that novel was called Serpents Among the Ruins. And one thing I wanted to do was sort of redeem Harriman is not quite the right phrase, but I wanted to justify his portrayal both from the script and by the actor in Generations. Uh, I wanted to, to show that you know, Starfleet command are not a bunch of idiots, uh, that they're not going to put somebody incapable of commanding a starship in command of a starship, because it's not just about the, the hundreds of people aboard. It's also about, you know, the planets, the civilizations they visit, and there's diplomacy and, you know, first contacts, all of these things. So I, I wanted to really just sort of dig into Harriman, and, and, and Serpents Among the Ruins allowed me to go... Um, into his history a little bit, um, um, even though I didn't do a lot of uh, flashbacks and things, it allowed me to explore his relationship with his father, um, which uh, da uh, Peter David had introduced in The Captain's Daughter. He'd introduced his, his uh, admiral father, and which then made sense to me that here is an admiral who is very self-involved and self-centered, and uh, what his son does is, is he doesn't care about it in terms of of his son. He cares about it in terms of how it reflects on him. Um, mm. You know, he's just not just egotistical, but an egoist. So uh, he, he, uh, that allowed me to just explore that relationship and how it impacted Harriman and how it sort of pushed him forward in his career faster than he otherwise probably would have because his father opened some doors that he didn't really want opened, but his father pushed him. And anyway, it allowed me to explore all of that. Mm -hmm. But in doing that, um, I mean, Demora, who we saw was, was, um, you know, she was you know, the helm, helm and her navigator in, uh, in generations, you know, she became a major character in Serpents Among the Ruins. And I just, I really loved writing her. In part, you know, that's it's kind of a she was kind of a blank slate um, mm -hmm. because we only, she was only on screen for what six minutes or eight minutes or whatever mm -hmm. it was. Um, you know, in some ways, that's actually why at some point there was this huge clamor for uh, Hikaru Sulu novels, and which ultimately uh, came to fruition. But but I think part of the reason people wanted that, and this was Marco's idea as well, is that. Well, we, we know Sulu and Chekhov and Uhura from the original series, um, and I'm talking pri prior to the movies, they're mostly sort of, they're, and I, I don't mean this disrespectfully, but they're almost set dressing because shows yeah. were not yeah. ensembles mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. back in the 60s, right? They were, mm-hmm. I mean, that show, Star Trek starred Cur- uh, William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy and DeForest Kelly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, exactly. uh, Jimmy Doohan Jimmy Doohan got some more to do, but Michelle Nichols didn't have as much to do. She, her presence there was important, and I wish she'd had more to do, but it, it, mostly she wasn't, she was just on set, and that was mostly true of Sulu and, and Chekhov and, and, and there's Chapel and the you know, Rand. But um, but because they're sort of blank slates, because we didn't get to know them very well, people sort of have affinities for these characters and then and so they want to see them explored. The problem with that is that once you start defining who a character is, because they haven't been defined, really well defined on screen, it might clash with what a viewer's what expectations are, what they've impressed on the character themselves. And so all of a sudden you've got this dissonance that is pretty difficult for, you know, for a reader to overcome sometimes. But, you know, you take on those challenges. I was fortunate because, as I said, Demora was kind of a blank slate. We didn't see her and we hadn't seen her for years and years and years. She just had the one appearance. So it was kind of hard to uh, uh, impress on her uh too many different characters. So I, I you know, David, uh, Peter David used her in The Captain's Daughter, but she was a secondary, even a tertiary character in there who didn't really appear much. So I really had a lot of, a lot of room to maneuver with her and um, really loved writing her so much so that I, I later wrote a novella called Iron and Sacrifice um, about Demora when she was captain of the Enterprise, uh, the Enterprise B. And um, I really, I really loved writing that. Uh, that was a, a captain's table story, which um, the captain's table, for any viewers not who don't know, was uh, a series of, of short stories, novellas, and novels um, written. That the captain's table is a bar, um, kind of like E. e. Van Vogt's you know, science fiction bar that, you know, appears and disappears. And it, it, it shows up in various places and only captains go in, can, can go in and they, you know, they, uh, the price for drinking is a story. Mm-hmm. So that's the conceit. That's the sort of framing, uh, uh, part. Um, and yeah, so that was fun. And I, I, I keep, I keep losing my AirPod. I'm going to leave that one out. Um, <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, that was, she was great, a great character. And then when I told that captain's tale story, the iron and sacrifice, it was, um, she told a story and in that story was another story. And in that story was another story. So it was a story within a story within a story. So that was a lot of fun to write in terms of structure. And it also gave me a lot to write about her. Um, so that was fun. I really liked, like Demora a lot. I, and then I would later write another Demora Sulu novel, um, one constant star, which I which I enjoyed. So yeah, you know, Kira is one of the characters I love to write. Rolaren, um, um, Demora Sulu. I enjoyed Harriman, um, and then also it's fun to create original characters. Uh, I have a, a love interest for Harriman named Amina Sassine, who who I really loved. Um, uh, but you know, you you kind of. You kind of have to love all your characters when you're writing them. You certainly have to understand them. You can't, they can't, even the villains. I mean, villains are very boring when they're just, you know, one dimensional. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> villain, villains, a good villain should believe that they're the hero of the story. Right. right? And, yeah. and, have, and have reasonable justification for that. I have very a Killmonger. <laughs> Right, right, oh, exactly. I mean, Killmonger. It, it, was, it was really interesting. I mean, in, the, in the film, you're like, you know, he's kind of right. right. Uh, <laughs> That's kind of everybody uh, is like, he's kind of right. Ooh. Yeah. So, I mean, not much more interesting villains. I, I've occasionally written, uh, I think I've written maybe two villains who were insane. Um, not as interesting, awfully fun. <laughs> um, but not 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 quite as interesting. You you just you want a, a, a villain to feel that they're the hero of the piece uh, and have let's say reasonable justification. Oh, I should say I Khan. Khan, he thinks he's quite reasonable. Well, I I thought I mean, he's I don't, I don't think reasonable, but he thinks, I don't he's, think, right. Well, he, he thinks he's right. He's yeah. not he reasonable, he's right. but he thinks he's right because he was mentally superior. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, Khan, 
<laughs> Khan. You are uh, quite honestly uh, a people. <laughs> Khan is an interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think about Khan in the wrath of Khan as opposed to Space Seed. Um, I mean, the, the characters were consistent, but their motivations changed, right? I mean, mm -hmm. his motivation mm -hmm. changed. In, I mean, Space Seed is more, more sort of understandable. He's used yes. to leading. Um, he, he does genuinely believe himself superior, which you know, obviously goes into Wrath of Khan as well. But um, Wrath of Khan sort of turns into, I mean, he, you see an end game for him where he does start, start taking control of things. But for a lot of it, it's just revenge, which is sort of less interesting um, mm -hmm. than, I, I mean, I, I loved the Wrath of Khan, but it would have been a little bit more interesting had they explored where he ultimately wanted to go, which is, again, to rule. Um, mm -hmm. But that wasn't as well explored. Still a great movie, though. Um, but yeah, Khan, Khan completely believes he's reasonable. Um, well, he <laughs> believes he's right, if not He reasonable. believes he's absolutely right. Yeah. Now, you so worked I, with... Uh, with Eric Stillwell, who was on this show and who, who you know, I know well from, from my Starfleet days because um, he headed the, the organization. Uh, tell us a little bit about the whole process with, with Prime Factors and, and that whole collaboration. Well, Prime Factors was interesting. Um, I can't remember what we initially called it because it wasn't Prime Factors, which is ridiculous because I'm a mathematician and Prime Factors is an obvious name. I should have title. I should have come up with. Um, we, you know, we, we went and pitched, uh, 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 several stories to Michael Piller. Um, and Eric's, uh, Eric himself, I think had the notion of creating prime factors as, uh, we wanted to use Gary seven from the original mm -hmm. series. Um, which we thought was a great idea at the time. Um, and it, and it was Voyager was in its nascent stages. I mean, we we hadn't seen a frame of the show. The show wasn't on the air. It was barely in production. I think they were filming, when we pitched, they were filming the pilot. You know, and so we had a Bible. Um, but, you know, it's really different seeing a character on a page and seeing a character on screen, right? Because actors and the directors and the writers imbue, but particularly the actors imbue characters with, you know, a, a real sense of who that person is. Um, so it's not as easy just writing from a, a description of the character, but, but we thought having a, an original series tie would be just a great, a great way to try and bring viewers forward. Uh, Michael Piller, who, saved Star Trek. I mean, Star Trek was on, Star Trek The Next Generation was on the verge of cancellation when Michael came in in the third season and, and in my mind, saved the show. Um, and he's just, he was a, uh, a good guy and he was a terrific writer and he really, he always tried to make the scripts better. Uh, he was the head writer and he, he was always trying to find, he always, he wanted the scripts to be about something. Um, but at that point, um, Michael did not like the idea of of ties to the original series or or well um, or Next Generation or Deep Space Nine. Even he felt it was a crutch, and 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 I, and I get what he's I get, I get got where he was coming from. I, I'm pretty sure that Michael, at some point in our pitch, because we had three or four stories that we pitched, made that clear. And so I'm pretty sure Eric and I actually when we pitched that um, when we pitched at Prime Factors, we didn't actually bring up Gary Seven. <laughs> I, I, I don't think we actually, I think we both sort of panicked in the room and decided not to bring it up because it would just get shot down. Um, and so, um, but we ended up, we ended up, uh, Michael kind of liked the idea and um but he wanted it to be um, I mean, because basically the premise is that, that we run across a, the Voyager crew runs across a, a society that has the potential, the, 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 the technology, technology to send, send them home. Basically a, 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 a hyper long transporter. Um, and so 
Uh, but but they have their own prime directive, which prevents them from sharing it with us, <laughs> which, which we love the idea. of. I mean, that was really the crux of the whole thing anyway, which is that we're, we're hoist by our own petard or Picard. Um, <laughs> uh, hoist by our own Picard. Uh, so, uh. yeah. And so that was really the, the basis of the episode anyway. Um, and Michael, at some point, we left. We left without having. We left the room without having sold it, but without having been completely shut down. And Michael sort of he he, he uh, pointed us to the movie, the classic film, the, the Bogart, Humphrey Bogart film, The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, which I had seen. I don't think Eric had, but we 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 rented it and watched it. And the thing about the Treasure of the Sierra Madre is that the gold the characters are searching for uh, in the movie ends up being iron pyrite, fool's gold. <laughs> it's not actually gold. Mm. And well, like we didn't quite understand how, I was like, the whole idea is that there's this technology that can get us home and we can't use it. So where, do, where does the fool's gold come in? I mean, it just didn't make any sense to us, but we tried to make it work anyway uh, we tried to mm -hmm. fit those ideas in, and so we wrote up, uh, you know, another pitch, and we went in and, and, and pitched to Jerry Taylor just on, on her own, um, and and Jerry was like, "Yeah, this isn't what we were talking about." I'm like, well, "Yes, that's what Michael was talking about," uh, and so we actually got another shot to 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 work the story, and then that version of it is what we sold. Um, so we didn't get to write the script. They were actually auditioning um, a couple of writers uh, to be staff writers, and so they they asked them to write the script. Um, but it was most it was mostly you know what we had on the page um, in terms of the story, um, and it, you know I, I think it came out pretty well. Um, certainly happy to have had the credit. It was so when you jumped on before we all came uh, on uh, you know live. That's what we were talking about. We were actually making jokes about the fact that another culture prime directive, the ultimate prime directive culture, which is Star Trek. So that's that was when we were saying we we're having a random conversation. We were laughing about it as we were talking about that episode, and I went, "That's kind of the best part of it is that." We do that to, especially like I was using the example of the mm -hmm. Kazon, is that we wouldn't give them a uh, replicator for water because we knew that they would do X, Y, Z. Well, the Sakarans did kind of the same thing. Even though they didn't know we would do whatever, they also wanted a bunch of stuff and they just could care less why we wanted it. But we got prime directive when we prime directive others. I thought that was a great hey, concept. Throw them back in their face. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, you I don't ever get to see it. It's hilarious. Yeah. I think it's it's it was well worth exploring, and you know that kind of thing. You, you know, Star Trek. I guess the Prime Directive is generally viewed as Gene Roddenberry's response to Vietnam. Um, you know, don't interfere. And uh, I start. What's always appealed to me about Star Trek, even when I was a kid, is that it's about something. Generally, mm -hmm. um, I'm not. A, a, as big a fan of Star Trek when it veers into, you know, action movie territory. Um, I go to James Bond for that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, the fact that Star Trek is about something and that prime directive, right or wrong. I, I mean, that's a, 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 an interesting idea to explore, you know? Um, and, and the other thing about Star Trek is that it's so, um, inclusive long before that was a thing right mm -hmm. yeah i grew up in new york city never ever would have occurred to me to like or dislike somebody because they were black or brown or yellow or white or whatever uh, a, a boy or a girl or a, or a man or a woman or it, it didn't matter everybody was different and i mean i thought that's the way the world was it's not unfortunately um, so, but seeing that reflected in Star Trek, seeing the, 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 the mix of, of cultures and, um, I, I just, that inclusiveness, um, the, the ideas of inclusiveness and diversity that has, is, has always appealed to me about Star Trek. That has always been the most important thing. 
the, the spaceships are cool. The phasers are cool. The transport, all of that is great. But the stories that you can tell um, is just, it, you know, Star Trek is also sort of, I mean, for, for its time, I guess it was blatant, but it's sort of subtle because although Star Trek has plenty of episodes that are about inclusiveness, um, uh, 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 that, that highlight diversity, um, and that actually talk about the evils of racism and sexism and, and what have you, it, a lot of it sort of initially is just, it's just right there. It's just, you just who is on the bridge there's a black woman on the bridge there's an asian man on the bridge you know it's second and they're not maids they're not they're not maids they're not you know they're not a butler you know all of these things yeah it's second season we get the russian you know and spock himself is you know an alien and and um um i mean he's non-human and that's that's all of that is important um and it just for that to show up in 1960s television was 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 revolutionary. It really, really was, and it, important. And um, yeah, I mean, I just that that is why I have always been drawn to Star Trek. And it's it's really Ta-da. interesting. In in the last few <laughs> years, it just seems like like more and more people, although they're not necessarily putting in ter- uh, in you know in the context of Star Trek more and more people are understanding we're just all people. We're just people. Just can't, you know, let's, let's just, we're all in this together, you know, which is a, which is a much better philosophy for a society than every person for themselves or worse, every man for himself. Right. So, um, agreed. (laughs) That's, I mean, that's literally what my love of Star Trek is, even though, you know, I grew up in like, 80s 90s and it's still even in that time you know people talk about like the show friends you know that's one of the most popular shows ever did not have a very lived in new york not a diverse cast um you know or like girls lived in new york not a and i'm from houston and it's funny is that for houston it's very diverse when i tell people like texas it's very it's not as it's not as closed as people think it is and you know right. houston's one of the most diverse cities you could ever go to and they're like what right. it's in texas and then they go there and they go oh this is not what i mm. think so i know and that's you know growing up seeing star trek especially like seeing deep space nine you see a father with a son who's not a deadbeat especially being you know black woman and you're like you know you're always on tv the only black men you ever see are deadbeats or they're gangsters or they're this it's such a, you know, and that's, you know, why would I not gravitate towards something that's Star Trek? Why, why would anybody not gravitate? <laughs> yes, mm-hmm. of course. Exactly. You know, yeah. I, I, I think it's pretty well known at this point that at the end of Deep Space Nine on television, mm-hmm. uh, initially they were going to kill Cisco, uh, the, the writers, um, um, noble death, you know, ending the war, and Avery Brooks objected. Um, mm-hmm. strenuously because he felt he didn't want to play into the, the, the narrative of a black man, a man abandoning his family. Mm-hmm. Now I have no doubt that that's not what the writers intended. They wanted him to die a noble death and it was about the character, not about, but for Avery completely it's... understandably, it was about that. And which is why, he ascended into the celestial temple and, and said he would be back rather than dying. Um, but I, the most, um, probably the most uh, uh, criticism from readers that I ever got was for Rough Beasts of Empire, which is a Deep Space Nine novel that involved Spock and Cisco. And um, in the novels, at some point, the Romulan Empire cleaves in two. There's the Romulan Star Empire and... Uh, I forget what we call the other entity, but there are two Romulan Romulan civilizations. They've, they, they've split, and they had so they had you know two, there were were heads of both, and they were fighting each other. And Spock was involved in it, um, but there was also uh, a Borg threat to the Federation, and because of the Borg threat, Cisco, went, after he's returned from the Celestial Temple, ends up being you know, 
half volunteering, half conscripted back into service to, to help save the Federation from, from a Borg invasion. Um, but afterward, stays in, in, in Starfleet and essentially, and, and, and basically asks, or he doesn't even ask, he basically wants a divorce from Cassidy. And I got a tremendous amount of criticism for that, mostly because here's a black man abandoning his family again. And I completely understand that criticism. Remember I, I said I like to make things harder on myself when I write novels? <laughs> this was part of that. Because here's the thing. In Deep Space Nine, Cisco was told by, by um, the prophets, or the wormhole aliens, depending on your point of view, um, that if he, if he, he, he told them he wanted to spend his life with Cassidy. And they said, if you do, you will know nothing but sorrow. Mm -hmm. And that never played out in the show. He went with Cassidy and he didn't know nothing but sorrow. That didn't happen. But in the novels, what I, I have happen is an, a series of events happened to Cisco. Tragic events. Um, he's, they, he and Cassidy uh, and their daughter, uh, Rebecca, Cassidy gives birth uh, in the novels, um, and uh, uh, they're living on Bajor. He's no longer captain of Deep Space Nine. He's no longer in Starfleet. He's come back from the Celestial Temple, and they've got their family. Sorry, spoiler alert. Still worth reading. Um, uh, SD, Stephanie Perry's Avatar two-book series is terrific, uh, a really worthy continuation of the, sh of the series. Um so they're a little bit on Bajor, and a series of things happens to Cisco, starting with um, um, the death in a house fire of, of his and Cassidy's close friends. Um, and, and then a series of other really terrible things, one sort of worse than the next happens, you know. Um, and, and Cisco becomes convinced because of his relationship with the prophets, because of what they said to him, if you spend your life with Cassidy, you will know nothing but sorrow. He comes to, to believe that that's true because, well, you know, the prophets are of all times. Um, and that's what they said to him. And so he, he becomes convinced that eventually, as things keep getting worse in his life, eventually something terrible is going to happen to Rebecca, his daughter, and Cassidy, his wife. He believes that they're, they'll, they'll die, uh, that this is just going to get worse if he spends his life with Cassidy. And so because of that, he, he doesn't want to leave her. He doesn't want a divorce. He loves her. He loves his daughter. But he feels that they're in jeopardy if he stays with them. Mm. And to me, it was a, a terrible personal conundrum. I mean, I love my wife. If my staying with my wife was going to result in her death next week, what do I do? Right? I mean, what do I mean? That, I, I just thought that was a terrible personal dilemma, and so I faced Cisco with it. And to me, it wasn't about him being black. It's easy for me to say, right? Certainly, as a white writer too, you know. Um, but I was mindful of it. But I thought it was a good story, um, and I also had a long game for Cisco and Cassidy as well, and. So when I wrote this, I also knew it wasn't going to stick, right? What Cisco's done by doing that, though, and by staying away from her for, for a while, is he's disrupted. He doesn't spend his life with Cassidy. There's a good chunk of time where he's not with her. And so it undoes the prophecy, right? He, if you spend your life with Cassidy, you'll know nothing but sorrow. Well, he didn't spend his life with Cassidy. He left. Now he's coming back. So now it's sort of upended the prophecy. Um but I, I knew that. The readers didn't know that. So I got a lot of criticism for, for Cisco leaving Rebecca and, and Cassidy. And, and I understood it, but I also still thought it was a story worth telling. Mm. And it's interesting because with the advent of the Internet, um, readers, viewers know that Avery Brooks had this objection, Right. And maybe it's not just the internet. This is an article about Avery Brooks' objection to the first draft of the, the finale episode. Could have ended up in the Hollywood Reporter or Variety, perhaps. You know, some interview that Avery did. Um, but perhaps not. Viewers and readers know a lot more about 
the creative process now than they used to. And um, I don't know if as many readers would have even known that Avery had these objections and, and so come to sort of his defense when I did something different in mm -hmm. the books. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. I, I, I thought it was a story worth telling because I thought it was just, it just a, uh, an interesting personal um, uh, a problem to be faced with, you know, mm -hmm. stay with somebody you love and who loves you and, yeah. and terrible things will happen or leave and things will be all right. I just thought it yeah. was a, a a, a good, a good question to uh, to ask. Hmm. Yeah. Um, we really enjoyed um, chatting with you today. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Happy to do it. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. It's great talking with you guys. I definitely enjoyed listening to your stories. That's, I think yeah. that's the best time about when, especially when we speak to authors, because listening to stories and listening to the process, it does help people like myself, you know, or readers understand, you know, your motivation or what you're trying to convey to us. So it's, it's been really enlightening. So thank you. We enjoyed having My you. Pleasure. Thank yeah. you, Bob. I've thank wondered, you, Danny. Thank you, Dan. I wondered if you're working on anything currently that you'd like to promote. Uh, I, I, yes, but I can't um, <laughs> because it hasn't been announced <laughs> yet, unfortunately. Not yet. Uh, yeah. Uh, I've got a couple of irons in the fire, um, um, a couple of things I'm writing on spec, but one thing uh, is not on spec, but it, it hasn't been announced yet, so I can't say anything. Understand. Sorry. Believe me. Maybe next oh, we'll, time. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll definitely add links to the bottom so that our viewers can see um, your page, especially like Simon & Schuster, so they can uh, figure out ways to uh, follow along. So they can definitely uh, snatch up all those stories of Deep Space Nine. Sorry, I love Deep Space I have, Nine. Uh, I, have a, I have a page on, on, on Simon & Schuster's Excuse website that's about to get updated. They, they've just put out a new author questionnaire, uh, or they're about to. It's coming out on the 11th. Um, so I'll be, I'll be doing that, but I've also got a, I've also got a Facebook page, David R. George III, and I've got uh, a website, drgiii.com, um, and I'm on, I'm on Twitter, and you know, people can find me on the internet, it's pretty easy. It is true. Yeah. That's yeah. what the internet does. That's right. <laughs> a small <laughs> world. Thanks, David, so and much. thanks also to uh, Danny and Bob for coming on today. Um, to our viewers, please remember to like and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Um, we'll see you next time. Check you later. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye. <laughs>